Everyone wants it, dreams of it, schemes for it. A lot of people have uh, dreams of unlimited wealth. You can just print as much money as you need. To feed the frenzy, the U.S. government is making it. We use tons of paper, tons of ink a day. Counterfeiters are faking it. We have a problem that is worldwide. It's global. And thieves are taking it. There was an employee who had a artificial leg, and over a period of time, would place gold bars in the leg and walk out with them. Uncover the need and greed for green. Cash, a big stack of greenbacks. Nothing in the world gets the pulse racing faster. Most of us earn it the hard way, but others have shortcuts. It's a battle between those making it and those faking and taking it. And ground zero in this currency combat is the U.S. Mint and the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. <laughs> These two branches of the United States Treasury crank out over $650 million worth of bills and coins a day. Combined, these mega money factories employ over 5,000 people and cover millions of square feet. And security is state of the art. But where there's money, there's trouble. And some just can't resist the temptation to get rich quick. One man dreamed up a scheme so outrageous it would go down as one of the biggest, boldest counterfeiting operations in United States history. His name, Wayne Victor Dennis. His goal, to become a multimillionaire, literally overnight. Now, he's about to reveal his secrets on camera for the first time ever. Well, counterfeiting has always been kind of a dream way in the back of my mind. I think a lot of people have uh, dreams of unlimited wealth where you can just print as much money as you need. 1991, Wayne Victor Dennis sets his plan in motion. The first step, it takes money to make money. So Dennis empties his savings accounts and borrows whatever he doesn't have to pull together his target budget of $50,000. Next, he contemplates what denomination to counterfeit. I chose $20 bills because hundreds get scrutinized too easy. 20s, I know that people just accept them like they're nothing, they'll just take them and throw them in their cash register drawer. First, Dennis needs a place to print the counterfeit bills. He rents a house from his uncle in South Florida. He soundproofs a secret room, then moves in a 750 pound offset press that he picked up from a printing supply house. It's a machine he knows nothing about. But that's not going to stop him now. What was supposed to be a two-year vocational school, I taught myself in two weeks through experimentation. Dennis now begins the plate making. Using a stationary camera, he photographs four brand new $20 bills. It's at this stage when Dennis knows he's crossed the point of no return. Once you start photographing the money and you have negatives, then that's when you start getting nervous because now there's evidence against you. The next step, he needs paper, but not just any paper. It has to have the distinct weight and texture of money. Unfortunately, the only paper that has no watermarks is standard typing paper. Without paper thick enough to pass his cash, Dennis's counterfeiting scheme could be shut down way before payday. But he's persistent. He comes up with an idea, a chemical solution, his own concoction that builds the paper thickness to 24 pounds, the weight of real currency. Now, what about the ink? I had to figure out some way to get that paper colored green like currency. But the color of money isn't easy. The wrong shade could send him to the slammer. Dennis is determined, though, to get it right. So he takes his biggest risk yet. He actually cuts off the corner of a real bill and sends the tiny sample to an ink manufacturer. A bold move that could be his biggest mistake. And I figured Secret Service would be knocking on my door right shortly thereafter. Days go by. Dennis's mind races with fear. Will the ink or the feds arrive at his doorstep? 
to his relief, it's the ink and the perfect shade of green. Dennis is ready to roll. The toughest part, getting the paper to look and feel real, was accomplished and I was very excited. And I just felt I was rich. But surprisingly, not every greenback off the press is a masterpiece. There are smudges, double prints, misprints. There's plenty of trial and error, because one error will send him straight to trial and jail. Dennis needs the bills to be perfect. I had probably about a quarter of a million dollars of wasted counterfeit before it started looking very spendable. Once they pass his scrutiny, Dennis goes for the jackpot and prints up million after million in bogus $20 bills. And eventually, one by one, then 20 by 20, then hundreds of bills start pouring out, each more perfect than the last. He tallies up his production, $11,750,000. The short answer to what it feels like is to watch $100,000 a minute come out of the printing presses. Very exciting. It comes out so fast it looks like a blur. And that's a lot of money. It's the instant rush of becoming an instant millionaire. But the cash isn't ready to spend just yet. The bills need to look worn. The solution? That came during uh, laying in bed before sleep. I would think of all the intricate details. Dennis creates his own chemical aging process with coffee grinds, starch, and distilled water. And then on a marble uh, tile, wearing surgeon gloves so you don't leave fingerprints, you would ball the money up. Then you'd have to take them back out one at a time and just one. intoxicates Dennis, sending him and his girlfriend on a spree across the country. One thing that I thought was pretty ingenious was to leave some of the counterfeit at grocery stores, throw a little out the window at nighttime so people would find it and they would cash it in places I would never cash it. So therefore the Secret Service couldn't say a pattern. Finally, they pull into the ultimate money mecca the bright lights and big greed of Las Vegas. I figured if we can pass it in Las Vegas and not get caught, then we can pass it anywhere. Because the, the uh, change persons in the casinos, that's all they do in the hours a day is handle money. And it passed quite nicely. About $4,000 an hour they were able to funnel through the casinos. Dennis and his girlfriend become instant high rollers. At first, Alex and I were cashing the counterfeit through the casino and we're playing 21 and roulette and getting changed from the uh, uh, cashiers. We're making great money. Flush with success and fatigued by the hard work of making millions, Dennis and his girlfriend decide to take a break. So we decided to go upstairs to the mezzanine where they had arcade games. Ironically, it's when they let their guard down that the stakes get their highest yet. Dennis passes off a counterfeit 20 to a teenage employee at an arcade game. She's not experienced with big cash, but she has a nervous habit that's about to expose his entire operation. She was tearing the corners off of all the bills, and when she tore the corner off one of my bills, she noticed it was white inside. I did not put enough uh, 
alcohol in the ink to bleed it through the paper so it was white inside. She called security without alerting me. Dennis is immediately backroomed, but he's prepared to face off with the feds. We came up with this story that uh, I found a briefcase on a dock in Miami. And uh, when I got home, I opened up the briefcase, I had to pry it open, and I found currency. But the authorities don't buy it. While Dennis is locked up in jail, Secret Service agents search his hotel room. They find the smoking gun, a logbook that describes every incriminating detail of the operation. And I knew we were pretty much finished. That logbook, that was the damning factor. Counterfeiter Wayne Victor Dennis thought he could create his own mega money factory, but he was tripped up by the saturation of the ink and the quality of U.S. Treasury paper. The real paper comes from Crane and Company of Dalton, Massachusetts. They've been making special paper for U.S. currency since 1879. Their product is unlike any other paper in the world. A U.S. currency has that feel of strength that you can snap and feel. The recipe for making paper nearly impossible to counterfeit is top secret. But here's a hint. Most paper is made from wood. Crane and Company's currency stock is made from cotton and linen. The eight-step process begins with 6,000 pounds of cotton. It's loaded into a giant boiler and pressure cooked for two hours. Next, this mess is dumped into a massive tub the size of a swimming pool, where it's cleaned and bleached. The raw materials are pressed, then dropped into giant blenders called pulpers. This unique process is what gives real paper money that crisp feel that's nearly impossible to duplicate. The paper makers also add some amazing high-tech secrets we're about to expose. It's all in the inside layer, the same layer that tripped up counterfeiter Wayne Victor Dennis. Paper has a front and a back, and most people don't think a lot about the middle. But it's in the middle of the paper that a lot of the technology that contributes to making paper a counterfeit deterrent resides. It's a technique first introduced in 1996, when upper denomination bills got their major makeover. While the pulp is still wet, highly trained specialists tint the pulp, add color fibers, and presidential watermarks. Much of the exact process is top secret, but here's a tip. The fibers are drawn to conform to a wire mesh pattern in the forming process. That image is simply a result of more and less of the very same fiber that constitutes the bulk of the banknote. Next, it's time to add the Treasury Department's ultimate secret weapon, one that no counterfeiter has yet been able to replicate. They're called security threads. Each of these threads has microscopic numbers on them, 42 thousandths of an inch tall, denoting the bill's value. Using transmitted light, the text is clearly visible, but copiers and counterfeiting machinery that use reflective light see nothing. Can printing presses like the one Wayne Dennis used match this microscopic detail? You'd have better luck replicating a Rembrandt with a paint roller. The high-tech paper is now ready for drying. Using furnace-like heat, the paper presses move with precision to squeeze out any moisture and create rolls that are eight feet wide and weigh more than four tons. Since the watermarks and security threads are embedded inside the paper, each giant roll is made for just one denomination. This giant tube looks more like bulky insulation than a big bank roll. But think again. You're looking at three and a half billion dollars worth of $100 bills in the making. It would be very difficult to count up this. They did a great job in redesigning what the federal government did. This paper is transforming into some serious cash. It's the stage where stakes and security skyrocket.
Wayne Victor Dennis made nearly $12 million of fake bills by cranking them out on a standard printing press. But the real deal? It all happens here in Washington, D.C. at the Bureau of Engraving and Printing's huge money factory. Every step along the way is designed to stop counterfeiters in their tracks. They occupy acres and acres of space, hundreds of thousands of square feet. It's a major operation. Inside, thousands of employees are involved in the money-making process. 24 hours a day, five days a week. And security? It's round the clock and never blinks. Because working with money can be very tempting. We've worked here at the Bureau for more than two or three weeks and it still looks like money to you. It's probably not a good job for you. In God We Trust might be the motto on money, but at the Bureau, trust is something they take very seriously. From the minute anyone walks through the door, they are searched, scrutinized, and watched by vigilant state-of-the-art security systems. Each morning, as employees arrive for work at the imposing Bureau of Engraving and Printing factory, they must pass through special magnetometers that screen for any hidden weapons. Security is so severe that cameras of any kind are immediately confiscated at the door to prevent would-be counterfeiters from stealing secrets or anything else. Once inside, a complex identification and scanning system tracks employees' movements everywhere they go. Motion detectors and alarms are placed strategically in key locations to prevent unauthorized access. The building is broken up into very specific security zones so that only those who are authorized to be in a specific zone have access to that. For extra security, many employees work behind steel cages where they are monitored by cameras. We have one of the largest closed circuit TV systems in the world. With employees under non-stop surveillance, the Bureau now focuses on their biggest task, thwarting counterfeiters. The high-tech paper is just the beginning. There are six steps in engraving and printing, and each one makes the bills harder to copy. It begins with a simple piece of steel that is transformed into a remarkable engraving. It's an old-world craft that takes talent, patience, and experience. All of the Bureau's engravers go through a 10-year apprenticeship, and their final product can take hundreds of hours to complete. For counterfeiters who want to get rich quick, there are no shortcuts. Oh, it takes a very special person to be an engraver, I think. It would drive most people mad, sitting here hovering three inches above a piece of steel, uh, just making one tiny little dot at a time. And what are the images? There are presidential portraits, but there also have been some unusual and perhaps unexpected images. Let's take a look at the $1 bill and break down the design. There's the famous pyramid with the eye. It's a Masonic symbol. Many founding fathers were Masons. The pyramid's unfinished, which represents the nation in its early stages. And the eye? For the Masons, this refers to the all-seeing eye of God. And what about the dollar sign itself? This symbol has been linked to everything from the serpent cross to the astrological symbol for the planet Mercury. And the eagle? It's said to represent Congress. In the right talon, it grasps 13 arrows. And in the left, an olive branch with 13 leaves and 13 berries. This represents the power of Congress to lead us into war or peace. One of the more recent design additions is causing enough controversy to make it to the courtroom. Back in 1955, Congress passed a law requiring the inscription, In God We Trust, to be added to the U.S. dollar. Fifty years later, in November 2005, Michael Newdow, a Sacramento doctor, lawyer, and atheist, filed a federal lawsuit claiming that the motto was an unconstitutional endorsement of religion. Since it's a law, it's really not a discussion point. Uh, to change that uh, would require that all the plates be redone uh, and would therefore add to the cost of currency. 
Bill design has its symbolic history, some say even mystical. But it's also very practical when it comes to thwarting counterfeiters. These hand-carved engravings are a brain-twisting, eye-popping, intricate network of fine lines and tiny dots nearly impossible to accurately copy. That's why I'm working here in the first place, because it's very, very hard to replicate a hand engraving where every single line, dot, and dash is paid very careful attention to. It's designed to foil forgery. With the printing plates ready, the job moves from skilled human hands to hardcore machinery, the Bureau's massive printer called the Simultan. This mechanical giant is over three meters tall and weighs nearly 46 tons. It's the only press in the world that prints both sides of a sheet simultaneously, something that counterfeiters can't easily replicate. Its job, stamp in some key images, the subtle peach and green stripes, the 20 USA banner, and the nearly invisible 20 numerals. After the ink dries for 72 hours, the Bureau's ready for the next step, the intaglio engraving press. It literally pushes the paper into the ink-filled grooves of the plate. It's the process that gives money that raised look and feel that's so hard to copy, something no color copier in the world can accomplish. The Intaglio Press prints one side at a time. The back side is first, the green back side. It needs another full three days to dry or else. And you can see how running your finger across it with just a little pressure will move the raised ink off and, and smudge it pretty good. Then the face side is ready for printing with black ink and another metallic ink with a unique security feature. It shifts color according to the angle. Every hour, one and a third tons of green, black, and metallic ink, and 10,000 newspaper-sized sheets of currency stock roar through these enormous presses. That's $6.4 million worth of 20s. With 24 presses in operation, the Bureau can produce as much as $650 million a day. The Bureau's money inspectors now examine every bill, and they've got to be absolutely, positively flawless to pass the test. Rivers of green and black currency sheets pass under optical scanners that take pictures of the front and back of each bill sheet, looking for the slightest imperfection. The inspection process is amazingly fast and efficient. Catching imperfect bills is almost as important as catching counterfeits. Each sheet moves through in under a second, it's given a number as it passes. This computer keeps track of 37 separate sheets of currency at once, comparing over 1 million microscopic squares with a master image. If the computer locates a mismatched square, it displays it on a monitor. Here's a demonstration, a smiley face. It'll be spotted and show up as imperfect in less than a second. Imperfect bills are so rare in the general circulation that they are automatically collectibles sometimes fetching thousands of times their face value. For example, in 2003, a flawed 20 sold online for $10,000. We find it odd that people would want to collect their mistakes. Once they pass inspection, the Bureau adds the Treasury and Federal Reserve seals and the bank and serial numbers to the uncut sheets of money. It's like the money's home address. If you know the serial number and the denomination and the series, those three things will uniquely identify that particular piece of paper. It's never duplicated so that we can tell when that note was printed and where it was originally issued. In a room the Bureau calls currency overprinting and packaging equipment, the money is finally cut, counted, and shrink-wrapped. It's now street-ready. If someone's going to pull off a heist, now would be the time. Bricks of 4,000 notes are stacked and sent to the vault. They'll wait there until it's time for delivery. The Bureau of Engraving and Printing makes billions in paper money every year. Counterfeiters try to rip them off. But does anyone bother with coins? Actually, coins have been in the crosshairs of scheming, thieving minds a lot longer than bills. 
Back when coins were made of gold, crooks would shave them down. Authorities countered by making coins out of less valuable metals. But that doesn't mean the war between the thieves and the feds is over just yet. This is the Philadelphia Minting Plant, the largest coin factory in the United States in both size and production. This massive fortress of a building spans the length of five football fields. Inside, this mega mints a fine-tuned combination of raw machine power and precision craftsmanship, and the security is stone cold serious. We are really in many ways the envy of the world mints. There are eight major steps in the minting process. It begins with a design. Whenever Congress authorizes a new coin or metal, the mint sculptor engravers sketch out their ideas. It's a contest. Whoever comes up with the best design wins. The prize? Having their artwork displayed on a U.S. coin means it's seen by hundreds of millions of people every day, a number that puts the Mona Lisa to shame. John Mercanti has engraved more than 100 coins and medals. It's a very privileged position to be in. It really is, especially as an artist. Until the 1970s, the sketches were hand drawn. When we had to uh, make a correction on the drawing, we, had, we would have to go back and redraw the whole thing. Computers have changed all that. Today, software programs streamline the process. After the design is approved, the artist takes up traditional tools to sculpt the clay model. It's usually three to 12 times the size of the finished coin. It, it takes a certain degree of um, concentration. Sometimes it's almost monastic uh, in, uh, in seeing the engravers in their cells, what I call cells, working very quietly and very intense. The team makes a negative rubber mold of the large design. Then, liquid epoxy is poured into the rubber mold and hardens, creating a more durable model to work with. This model is mounted onto a machine called a transfer engraver. At the other end, a tool cuts the reduced design into a steel blank called a hub. It will be an exact replica of the large model, but engravers still have to double check for any tiny errors. This is the only place in the world where you'll see a bunch of grown adults standing around the table completely frustrated over a little piece of metal that's the size of a quarter that just doesn't quite look the way they want it. Once perfected, dies, two pieces of steel that will stamp the design on the coins, are made from the master hub. Then, raw machine power takes over. Every day, inside this massive room, monster machines consume thousands of tons of 13 by 1500 foot metal strips of copper and nickel alloy, and every hour, punch out round blanks by the thousands. The blanks are softened in these towering annealing furnaces, and then run through a washer and dryer. Next, giant upsetting mills exert tons of pressure on the softened blanks, squeezing up rimmed edges. workday, the Mint has created another 80 million coins worth three million dollars. Counterfeiters don't typically bother with quarters, dimes, and nickels. When it comes to ripping off the Mint, the most likely threat is theft. Security is very serious, 
Anyone visiting or working at the Mint will have their pocket change immediately confiscated at the door. And the vending machines inside? They only accept prepaid plastic. No high security facility has ever really successfully been robbed unless it was due to an insider's participation. Over the years, the Mint has witnessed some of the strangest inside theft jobs ever. For example, there was Orville Harrington. In 1920, he was a $4 a day worker who couldn't resist the temptation. He took advantage of a unique personal attribute, a hollow wooden leg. It was the ideal place for hiding bars of gold. Over several months, he managed to hide and steal 53 bars. The value at that time? $80,000. The value today? Three quarters of a million. But Harrington was eventually apprehended when a co-worker got suspicious. His sentence? Ten years in the slammer. In the late 70s, the New York Mint was the target of an even more bizarre robbery. That facility uh, actually refined gold. So you would see gold in all different states of finish and seven ounce bars and just bulk little clumps and in uh, BB type size. So it was all over the place. It looked like Willy Wonka chocolate factory for gold. An employee came up with a deviously simple scheme that took advantage of a weakness in security checks. His key attribute was his height, and all he needed was a newspaper. He wrapped up gold dust in little bags, then rolled a newspaper up to cover it. He was about 6'7". When he would leave, he would stand uh, with his newspaper in his hand and raise his hand straight up over his head in order so the guards could search him very easily. And unfortunately, none of the guards were as tall as he, and so they could never reach his hand. You clean. Have a good one. You bet. Thanks. Today. It takes more than wooden legs and wrapped up newspapers to steal from these highly guarded facilities. They've got their own armed police force whose job is to protect over $100 billion in gold, silver, and coins. The Mint police go through vigorous training, including SWAT and anti-terror measures. The bottom line is preventing crooks from getting inside in the first place. Working around money means you have to make sure that the people are honest. And before they're hired, you make sure we check them thoroughly. And make no mistake, at the Mint, everything gets checked, from backgrounds to back pockets. The Bureau of Engraving and Printing and the United States Mint. Together, they're a powerhouse money-making plant, churning out millions by the hour. But they're not the only ones. Around the world, underground counterfeit cash factories are giving them a run for their money, literally. It's a major problem, a threat to the United States economy, and the stakes couldn't be higher. Historically, the United States has always been a nation where people believed they could get rich quick. But that dream has had a dark side. Ever since bills have been part of the United States currency, there have been people trying to fake them. In the early days of the dollar, counterfeiting was a raging epidemic. From 1837 to 1866, during the free banking era, 1,600 state banks printed their own bills, each with its own design. That adds up to 7,000 designs in total. That meant a lot of confusion for the public and lots of opportunity for counterfeiters to cash in. To fight back, President Lincoln approved a plan to combat bogus bills. He created the Secret Service. Most people know our role as the uh, protectors of presidents and heads of state and, and people like that. Very few people know our role in fighting counterfeit. 
Though United States bills are now standardized, they now face even bigger threats from abroad. They're the world's most popular currency, and therefore the most likely target of overseas counterfeiters. The Bureau of Engraving and Printing prevents counterfeiting before the bills even hit the streets. But once they're out, it's up to the Secret Service to catch counterfeiters. This is why the Secret Service was first formed in 1865, and to this day, it's what they do best. The Secret Service has many tactics to track down counterfeiting crooks, including this library of nearly 23,000 fake bills. When a bad buck comes in, researchers attempt to trace it back, determine the top suspect, and make the bust. The Secret Service also takes preemptive strikes. Together with the Federal Reserve, they've created software that prevents scanners from copying bills at 100%. Try it, and a warning appears on your computer screen. The fight against counterfeits not all high-tech. Secret Service dogs can sniff out more than drugs. We trained 12 dogs down there to detect counterfeit money by smell. It's based on the drug detection dog program that most people are familiar with. And sometimes, the hunt for counterfeiters takes the Secret Service to some of the most dangerous locations in the world. Colombia, known for its drug cartel, has another illegal and highly profitable export. was a major bust, but it was only the beginning. Authorities estimate that hundreds of these hidden money-making factories are scattered throughout the country. It's an underground war that the Secret Service still fights today. We have an office in Bogota. We work closely with the police forces down there. And together, we have made a significant dent in the amount of counterfeit money. The United States Mint and the Bureau of Engraving and Printing's job is to manufacture mega money. It's a high-stakes, high-security operation designed to stop counterfeits and theft. But once the money is ready to enter circulation, the opportunity for danger is even greater. When money changes hands, anything can happen. Transporting the money from the factories is a major operation that calls for the highest vigilance against gunpoint heists and even inside jobs. Each money factory has immense loading docks. Forklifts and transfer workers move the money under intense security precautions. Armed guards watch every move. At the transport points, as you're loading it or unloading it, is the riskiest part because the money is exposed for anyone to take. Millions of dollars are loaded up into unmarked 18-wheelers. And where do these semis go? They're headed to a main depot. After that, armored cars drive the money to every bank and branch that's part of the Federal Reserve System. Created in 1913, the Federal Reserve is the central bank of the United States, the clearinghouse for cold, hard cash. It was created after a series of financial panics and financial crises that occurred in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. In these crises, people got concerned about their deposits at their local commercial banks. 
Today, there are 12 Federal Reserve Banks nationwide, each serving a specific region of the country. The, the Federal Reserve is an intermediary between banks that have more currency than they need because they've taken in deposits, lots of deposits of currency, and banks that have a need for currency. And as that currency is deposited with us, and before it's sent out to the banks that have a need, we're like a filtering system. The Federal Reserve's giant vaults house the money until commercial banks need it. Then, armored cars take it straight to the banks. Once it hits circulation, currency passes through billions of hands. And billions of hands can do a lot of damage. An average bill circulates for five years before it's too tattered to go on. So how are bad bills pulled from circulation? When commercial banks receive cash, they in turn deposit it in the Federal Reserve Bank. It's here where all bills, the good, the bad, and the cruddy, come under close scrutiny. All 12 of the reserve banks have high-speed computer-controlled machines that count 40 bills a second, examining them with specially designed sensors to search for dirt, graffiti, and possible counterfeits. They send suspected fake bills straight to the Secret Service for examination. What happens to the old Warren bills? They've got a date with the shredder. The Federal Reserve Banks shred over $500 million a day. When these bills are shredded, they're out of circulation, and new bills are printed to take their place. But what do you do if your money is destroyed? The commercial banks won't take it, so this cash never meets the Federal Reserve's shredders. But it's still considered legal tender. So where does it go? Back to where it all begins. The Bureau of Engraving and Printing. The Bureau has a free service that most people have never heard of. It's called the Mutilated Currency Division, and anyone can send their most fragile fives and tattered twenties directly to their office for a refund. Hurricanes, tornadoes, all of the natural disasters that you hear, we get the remnants of the currency that has been damaged from those things. When bills first leave the Bureau, they're inspected for the slightest flaws. The messy bills that make it back undergo the same careful scrutiny. The Bureau employs 17 full-time examiners. In one year, they can process over 25,000 claims of mutilated currency worth nearly $100 million. The tools? Tweezers, knitting needles, small knives, tape, and glue. It takes six years of on-the-job training to learn the trade. Putting mutilated money back together is like a puzzle. Examiners must be able to piece together more than 50% of each bill to give a refund. If the bills are legitimate, the Bureau will write a check for that amount. This cash was burned in a house fire. The ashes must be reconstructed. You have to go through and you have to figure out which piece goes where, what goes to what note. Handling all this money, though, can be a filthy job. These toxic bills were sent in after steeping in stagnant floodwaters. There are a lot of smells that come to this office. Smells that you probably wish you had never smelled. Between the Fed's shredders and the Bureau's mutilated currency team, over a billion bills are sidelined from circulation every week. Everyone dreams of having more money, so why can't the Fed just order more to be minted or printed? Money used to get its value from gold. A $20 note would be redeemable for $20 in gold. Today, the gold standard is no longer used. They now have a 5.7 cent piece of paper and are going to issue that as a $100 bill. In order to do that, they purchase collateral. They purchase treasury notes, bonds, uh, that they hold for that value and they issue that note and it is represented by the value held by the bank. Sort of like you're writing a check and it's the value of that is made by the money that you hold in the bank. So that is really what it is. It really represents value. Essentially, the U.S. dollar is only valuable because we say it is. It's because there's a full faith and credit of the United States behind that coin or currency. If the U.S. government flooded the economy with more money, 
the value of that very same money would go down, leading to inflation. Today, cash is increasingly replaced by electronic credit and debit. Is there a bleak future for money factories? Some people want to clip a branch of the money tree for good. The penny, many argue, is quickly becoming obsolete. Others, however, believe the penny is an important icon we can't afford to lose. An organization that fights for the penny, Americans for Common Sense, was established in 1990 to educate Congress on the need to keep the penny. Their thought: since it costs 0.07 cents to make a penny, the U.S. government is making money off pennies, and after all, pennies are lucky. We were all small, and we saw a penny on the ground, and we picked it up. Or maybe it's one of those issues where, you, when you look at a penny, you realize good things come in small packages. That there's the small things in life which are wonderful,、um, and I think the penny, in many ways, reflects that. As long as there's the need to buy and sell, there's a need for money factories. The U.S. dollar is still the most reliable currency in the world. It's up to the Bureau of Engraving and Printing and the United States Mint to supply it. This cash has the embedded high-tech tricks to stop counterfeiters, the security to get delivered into the right hands, and that crisp snap that just can't be replaced. Nothing makes you feel like a million bucks, like a million bucks.